Hello and welcome to the episode of the Manufacturing Leads podcast with me, Mark Bracknell, Managing Director of Theo James Recruitment. Today we welcome on an extremely special guest, Steve Scrimshaw, who started off his career in 1979 with CA Parsons, which became what we all know, the Siemens. He was then Managing Director and then later um, to move to transition over to Siemens Energy um, as Vice as President and Exec Director. Very recently, only last week, Steve announced his retirement from Siemens Energy, which was, um, after 45 years, a big announcement. So as you can imagine, I was nervous and excited because um, such a privilege to be able to interview Steve. I'm not going to give you too many spoilers about this because it was such a good episode. As you can imagine, we talked in detail about energy, power, sustainability, the opportunities within the Northeast, the East Coast, the UK. We talk in detail about young people, the generation, this movement towards net zero and how they are a huge part of that, how we need to plug the skills gap. Obviously, I pick his brains regarding the culture behind Siemens and what um, helped make such a fantastic organization. What hit me a lot about this episode was just how humble Steve was. Um, Someone who has achieved what he has achieved. He is such a down-to-earth person and someone you are going to be absolutely inspired by so i won't give you any more spoilers without further ado please sit back enjoy the episode with steve please do me the biggest on a um, favor of liking and subscribing to the channel it really helps um thank you very much and i hope you enjoy excellent well a warm welcome to uh to see scrimshaw on this podcast and i absolutely can't wait to dig into your 45 unbelievable journey but before that I do that. First question I ask every person on the uh, the podcast. Steve, what does it mean to you to be a leader? Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be here and thanks to be asked to do this. Um, I think to be a leader, you have to be someone that probably has the capability to inspire others uh, to maybe come on a journey of where you're trying to go, where you're trying to take the business. I, I often say it to people, it's it's if you're, you imagine you're in a trench and you come run out the trench and there's people firing at you and it's whether people are prepared to jump out the trench to come with you. And I think to do that, you need to be authentic. You've probably got to be a good listener. You've got to be humble. I think recognize that you don't have all the answers and I think it's your job to try and mobilize the capability of the organization. Um, I think creating the right culture to allow people to speak up and contribute to the success or whatever of the business and bring their whole self to work. Um, you know, People have a lot of things that they can contribute. And I think I've learned that over the years that you actually have a lot of people in the organization that you probably don't know their capabilities and what they're capable of doing. And I think if you create the environment, I think that's your job as a leader to do that. Yeah, I love that. And I I love that analogy actually with with the trenches because you're right. Businesses go through tough times sometimes. And I think, you know, you know, we've seen that recently, probably the last five years where companies have had to pivot and had, had problems. And I think that's where... That's where you see how management has been, how loyal yeah. people are. That's absolutely, absolutely. There was an MP once who said, uh, "They said um, leadership and management is like a tea bag. You only realise how strong it is once it's in hot water." And I, and it's it's pretty good adage that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And, and and never probably more so now in a world where loyalty is oh, it's lower than it has been. I would say simply because of the power shift towards employees probably knowing that they're good enough to walk into an opportunity. So I think never has it been more important for, like you mentioned there, culture to be paramount really, to, to keep people engaged and, and the vision be there, I guess. Mm-hmm. Huge one. Um, I, there's so much to talk about with, with management. I I can't wait to dig into your journey because I was excited anyway, but obviously when I heard the news that obviously, you know, you were stepping down from, from your role after 45 years, Steve, is that right? It is, it is, yeah, 45 years. It's, uh, it's, it's quite surreal, actually, but uh, yeah. So I, I started, do you want me to just give you a little bit of a background? Please, yeah, 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 I think that would be great to start right So, again. so I, st- I, started, um, I started in 1979, would you believe, um, which is quite a while ago, and where I was probably one of probably quite nervous um, 100 apprentices on, on that day that rocked up at uh, CA Parsons Works at uh, Heaton in Newcastle there. And um, so I started as a mechanical technician apprentice. So it was a vocational uh, background that I went through. Um, and um, 
it was it was a done thing in those days that a lot of people actually were directed um i think when people were leaving school they were directed towards like you know apprenticeships or nursing or whatever it would be that type of thing and um i had probably four four offers of different apprenticeships at those times and and the the, the jewel in the crown was probably parsons i mean parsons uh, developed and designed the first practical steam turbine, you know, exporting from Newcastle, taking power all over the world and bringing power to people and industries all over the world. So, yeah, I started then. Um, we were in the apprentice school, which was uh, it was a quite a disciplined approach. You know, you all had to have your your, your, your overalls on and your, your hair nets and all the rest. Of it. I had hair in those days, um, <laughs> which was <laughs> quite interesting. Um, so, yeah, we, we did that. And in those days, you did the traditional sort of round of all of the various different things that you did. Um, in those days, we made everything. You know, we made pipes. We had a foundry. We had a pattern shop. We had design houses. We had blade manufacturing, large scale, very, very heavy machining, light machining. Um, we had test houses and erecting bays where we could build whole power plant lines, etc. So I did that, um, the usual sort of round of several years around that. <coughs> and then um, and then I had an opportunity to go out and work on site. Um, it was something I was wanting to do. Um, yeah, so I actually went and worked out on site um, where we did um, sort of servicing of uh, turbine generators. So um, I did all that round. Uh, I did the sort of site servicing of power plants in the UK and overseas. I uh, did that for quite a number of years. I got involved in roles like quality, planning, supervision, mechanical supervision. Then I went into like project management. I went into commercial management. This is things like doing, you know, spare parts, modernizations, upgrades, and power plants around the world. Um, and then uh, came in to do sort of more of the general management role. I went into sales and marketing, um, which was all about like trying to develop business on other manufacturers' equipment. Uh, in those days, it was owned by m multiple companies. So it was owned by Parsons, then it was um, owned by the, I don't know if you remember, the Northern Engineering Industries, which was the mm -hmm. big conglomerates in the Northeast. Uh, that was then bought by the Rolls-Royce Industrial Power Group, where they used, it was a bit of a cash cow used to develop the Trent engine. Um, and uh, we were part of the Rolls-Royce Industrial Power Group. And then I actually left the company and I went to work for Mitsui Engineering and Shipbuilding, which was um, up in Glasgow, a company called Mitsui Babcock, which was traditionally British Babcock making power boilers for power stations. Did a similar role to what I was doing at, uh, at Rolls-Royce. And then I did that for a couple of years, and then I was headhunted um, to come and join Siemens in their service business for turbine generators. So they actually bought the company I used to work for. Uh, I did that for some years. Um, and then back in October 2020, uh, we were carved out of Siemens and became Siemens Energy. And um, I uh, that's, that's the Siemens Energy piece. And I, uh, and I eventually ended up running that uh, that piece um in the interim between that i was asked if i would join and go and run the siemens transportation uh, trains business so i actually went and ran the trains business for between well, about nearly almost 10 years i did that uh, which was um which was really really interesting something that um, I really look forward to and something that uh, I really enjoyed because it was very complicated. It was something totally different. When I first joined there, I, I remember saying that to my wife, you know, they've given me this job and uh, and here I am. I could probably know what I know about trains and right on the back <laughs> of a bus ticket. It was it was that uh, that different. But uh, similar sort of things, big capital equipment, um, providing servicing and uh, making sure things you know, ran reliably, that type of thing. But it was a really interesting uh, experience. It's something, uh, you know, I look back with fondness on. Excellent. And, and you, you talk about apprenticeships and, and I'm, I'm really passionate about that and the fact that I still think there's a missing piece between, I think there's a missing education piece still in the sector with what you can achieve by <laughs> being an apprentice. There's, I think for, you know, for probably a couple of decades that, the known has been go to university and it'll, you'll get very far. And I think that can be a great route, but there is, you are one of a, 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 some brilliant people I've interviewed on here who are real <clears throat> stories, amazing stories of what people have achieved from starting right at the start as an apprentice. Yeah, and I, yeah. I still think that's um, an untapped resource. A lot of people I spoke to on here 
didn't really know what they wanted to do and, and were, you know, their, their mum, their dad might have forced them to do it or something. What is that something you always want engineering or how did that come about? No, it was, it was probably the same. And nobody in my family had gone and did a degree anything like that and I think it was a tradition you know that's the sort of direction that you got I probably didn't get very much sort of direction my dad was a shipbuilder um so he worked with swan hunters uh etc my mum brought up the kids uh, there was there's four of us um so yeah I, I sort of probably didn't get much direction but I think I always um I didn't want to be stuck in a factory all the time um I had this sort of thing and I've always sort of kept it with us that you know I wanted to be like a bit different I wanted not not just be me too and I think it was that self-drive. I often think, actually, with not doing a degree, you almost have to overcompensate for that in, in some respects. Um, but, yeah, I, I think the apprenticeship route, in, I mean, it's, it's given me wonderful opportunities, things that I could never, ever imagine. You know, it, it, when I sat, out, sat down in 16, did I ever imagine I would be doing what I'm doing now? Never in this world. And uh, the opportunities I've had along the way, I think you have to grasp the opportunities. Sometimes you've got to make the opportunities yourself. And I think that's the sort of internal drive uh, from yourself. You, you have to do that. It, it, it's not put on a plate for you. I mean, some people do get it on a plate, but I don't think it, it happens that much. And I think if you, I always sort of focus on the customers, and the end users and things like that, and just think of what they're trying to achieve. Uh, so, yeah. And, and I think apprentices have, apprenticeships have changed over the years um you know why would you want to go and you know engineering doesn't have a particularly attractive um uh, uh reputation i think you know like some people see it as a dirty business etc i mean we'll come back to that later because we'll talk about um if we're going to talk about the energy transition <clears throat> i think it's a wonderful opportunity for people but uh certainly um i think now people sort of see there are more choices and there's more opportunities you know some people might want to go into banking or other things and maybe those opportunities are not there there's a lot of stuff has been digitalized over the years and i think that gives other career paths where you know so and i think engineering now is, is probably competing with a lot of other attractive industries which um which is challenging for them so yeah so that's where i ended up yeah yeah did you and you mentioned there that you didn't think <clears throat> you would as as far as you i mean is that what what would you put that down to that drive to to not be a me too is that just come from but, somewhere internal um yeah yeah prob probably just internal but I, I mentioned about like i mean I'll, I'll use the degree and i don't mind speaking about i i've often during my career had a, a little monkey on my shoulder you know sort of saying you haven't got a degree and um and i remember once when i was uh, i was on the sort of leadership program within northern engineering industries and there was a a big you know Bastion of Northern Engineering Industries called Andrew Perkins, and he you you'd be interviewed with him and three other managing directors. I remember being interviewed. And, uh, you know, tell me what's the biggest thing you ever regret? And I and I turned around and said, well, you know, I, I do regret not not having a degree and not going doing a degree. I'm pretty sure I could have done it, but it was never being pushed or, or that direction never put in front of me really. And there was a sort of deathly silence for a, for about a minute. And then the MD of one of the other businesses says, well, well, I don't have a degree. And then somebody else says, well, I don't have a degree. And it was just this like revelation of saying, well, you know, maybe it isn't as bad as, as you think, you know, but um, I, I mean, both my kids have got degrees and that. And I, I would certainly encourage people to do that if they can. But I think, you know, keep your feet on the ground as well. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And again, I've got a degree and it was probably some of the best years of my life doing that. And I think the experience was amazing, but I, but I don't think it needs to be the essential way for everyone. And I think yeah. that, that's sometimes the, the misconception. But you're right, the, the the bulk of, I think, business owners and particularly manufacturing haven't necessarily come from the degree route. A lot of them have then gone back and done MBAs. And, and yeah. I think a lot of them will probably admit it's for the same reason you mentioned there, just to almost get that monkey off the shoulder. that they, they've, they've got it. Yeah. And, and, and I sort of like when you look back, you know, and I think, well, it hasn't done us too bad. You know, I've, I've run some of the biggest businesses of Siemens in the UK. I mean, okay, we're not part of Siemens now Siemens Energy and it's uh, it, it's just I feel immensely privileged to be being given those opportunities and do it but I think it's down to the, the hard work and the uh, sort of tenacity and focus and that sort of thing yeah and and you know this must be a, an interesting few weeks for you having announced that and and in doing this and, and and reflecting have you had time yet to sit down with a coffee and, and just start to reflect on on that career is that just starting to hit you well, yeah, it is. Uh, it is to say, it's a, it's a little bit surreal. So, just just for your listeners, so I um, I 
I have been thinking about it for some time, but I announced uh, that I was going to be retiring from Siemens Energy and my successor, a guy called uh, Darren Davison, do a good job. So he took over the helm from the 1st of January and I've sort of stepped back. I said I'd be around for a few months to support him in any way he wants. But it is, it's his role now and he's uh, he's at the helm. So it, it is a bit surreal. I've been clearing out all my historic documents and things like that yeah. uh, in the confidential bin and uh, sort of transferring a lot of uh, data. But yeah, um, yeah, I'll look back at it. And, uh, I mean, I did a did a, an article on LinkedIn where sort of it, it great. just 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 writing it down and actually sort of captures um, it just captures where you've been and you sort of, you often don't look in the mirror, do you? Look behind you in terms of what you've done and you you just take it for granted that you that you've done it. Um, and I've been absolutely, you know, it wasn't done for this reason. I was doing it because Darren's taken over the role now. And I, I sort of, that's why I posted the thing on LinkedIn because his announcement his announce was going to be out there. I'm going to be around at the end of March. Um, but I've just been humbled by some of the comments that have been made. Uh, it really does. It, I, I actually, I know this sounds a bit daft, you know, you, you see people at a funeral and they all say good things about people and stuff. And I feel like it's, like, I feel like it's actually <laughs> happened when I'm alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is, isn't it? And, 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 I think you know there's a lot of people that probably some people who are looking forward to that time some people are dreading that time you know when, when retirement comes for anyone it can be a shock can't it yeah yeah absolutely and, and I, I make no bones about it it's uh it will be a difference uh I, i've got i've got two grandkids now i've got my son and the grandkids live down in bristol and my daughter lives over in belfast she's married now and uh yeah it is you know i've got a bit of apprehension about it if i'm honest you know yeah. i'm I'm desperately trying to learn golf and uh, other things, but I'll probably do, I'll probably pick up a, an NED maybe a couple of days a month or something like that, uh, just to sort of, you know, so I keep a bit more relevant. I mean, I'm, I'm quite passionate about the energy transition. You know, I really believe in it. And I think that's going to be, you know, I mentioned about engineering before and the attractiveness of it. I honestly think that there's some wonderful opportunities there. And these are going to be career opportunities, not just project type opportunities as people have to transition towards net zero. And uh, I've been trying to um, contribute in whichever way I can to actually help on that journey. And uh, I'd like to sort of in some fashion continue with that as well as we as I retire as well. Yeah, that's exciting. And, and you mentioned that when you, when you started in that sector, Siemens, you know, <clears throat> your knowledge of that wasn't, I imagine, what it is now. When did that paint job be thought? Actually, this is a real opportunity. This is this is a movement. Yeah, I think I think um, we've got some really good people in our business who um, who have actually helped me. Um, I've learned a lot from them in terms of the energy transition journey. And then and then I think things start to fall into place, don't they? Where you you know, the government are making commitments to uh, net zero by twenty fifty. You've got all the COP arrangements, COP twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight. You can see that the if you just look around, look at what's happening with the climate and look at you know these immense wildfires, extreme weather events, and things like that. It's you know it's happening for a reason, and um, I think it's it's down to all of us. You know we we have a little bit of a saying that the generation before us haven't done it, haven't done anything quick enough. The generation after us it'll be too late. So it's down to us to actually try and make a difference. And you know, all the pieces are starting to come together now, aren't they? If you look at it, um, if I just talk about in the power industry, you've got like, you know, coal used to provide such a large volume of power, uh, there will be no coal plants running at the end of this year, right? None. You you know, you've got this proliferation of wind and and that's going all the way around the shores and onshore as well as offshore, but mainly offshore. And and, and I think with the Ukraine crisis, you know, like it, we, I think we were leading position on that. But with the Ukraine crisis now, everybody's looking at energy security. So everybody's, you know, moving at a pace around the world. So you've got wind, you've got hydrogen, everything needs an electrical connection, which means you need massive grid reinforcements. You're going to have to build a lot more grid than you've ever had in the last sort of 50 years. So it's it's almost like rewiring the whole country uh, to a lower carbon um, um uh, driven society you you think about when people talk about net zero i don't think they they really realize you know the the 20 the 29 million gas boilers that we have in the country that have to be replaced with something else your cars your planes your trains your boats everything's going to be have to be fueled with something different um and then everybody's going to have you know electric cars hydrogen cars whatever it's going to be and all of them are going to need more electricity too <laughs> so it's it's this it's this is not just incremental change. This is monumental change that has to happen. 
Apologies for interrupting this podcast for a very quick 30-second pitch of my business. Theo James are a specialist manufacturing and engineering recruitment search firm based in Seaham in the Northeast. If you're looking for any staff or a new opportunity yourself, from a semi-skilled level right the way up to C-suite executive, then please get in touch. We have a specialist consultant in each discipline ready to help. I'm extremely proud of what we've built over the years and I'd love to extend that service out to you. Thank you. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, and I think people are starting to wake up to it, but that's only a small percentage. You know, the the rest will when they're forced to. And I say that's that's a, a big job for the government to, to do. But I, but I, I think we're starting to see a shift. I, I've, I've started to see, this, to see the shift with manufacturing, which I think I ran an event 18 months ago and the on the agenda was sustainability. And there was a real lot of apprehension about what people need to do. And I've seen people now start to have real big plans, but there will be companies out there still a little bit concerned would you what advice would you give to a to company who perhaps hadn't started that journey yet and, and needs to sort of start kicking on with things whether that's the net zero yeah. carbon neutral yeah and, and i mean I, I recognize you know it, it is it, it's got a cost to it there's no doubt about it and um and some people cannot afford that i mean i think some you know like private individuals you know it's it's, it's great everybody talking about this but you know if you're struggling to make ends meet it's it's not easy but I think from businesses, you know, one of the things that we had in our business, and I'm not saying it works for everyone, but you, you have a very traditional sort of cycle that you, you need to invest in something and then you need to pay back over a certain point of time. And, and it's very hard to make these numbers, you know, pick, put solar panels on the top of a factory or something like that. It's, it's very difficult to sort of make that investment pay back over a, a, a relatively normal sort of payback period. If you start saying that you're going to get charged for your carbon emissions, which is probably going to happen, then then that whole concept changes. You know, like and we've started we started a while ago by what we call this like uh, charging like wooden dollars almost to say there's going to be a carbon charge for people who emit carbon, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden the economics of um, doing stuff um, for retrofitting and um, energy improvements, energy efficiency, become more viable. We've now, as a company globally, uh, we now actually charge. I think it's something like a hundred dollars uh, or 100 euros a ton for um, for carbon. So that actually brings everything back into focus. So that's enabled a lot of things to to invest in. And I think that's what will happen generally. You know, there's a trajectory where things are going. You know, if you're producing carbon, then you're going to be charged for it. I think eventually. So I would encourage people to start thinking a little bit a little bit more. I would also as well think of networks as well, like. Um, Maybe go and talk to bigger companies if they've, you know, there's maybe things that they are doing which can actually help. We we buy all of our uh, electricity's renewable electricity globally for our business, and and I think um, another thing I think the, uh, that I've recognised with um, being a listed company now is that um, you know people think of it as a, as an investment as a cost, but if you see you know people want to invest in green companies. And um, I think it's part of this um, ESG agenda item. So if you can be seen, you know, you can actually, instead of it being seen just as a cost, it could be seen as something that adds shareholder value yeah. to investment. And I know these are a bit like hard to sort of make a linear connection to, but I think very much people are, you know, pension funds and other things are saying they are only going to invest in green technologies or green businesses. And if you sort of see that as a, you know, you could invest X and it could increase your share value by Y just by doing it not a direct correlation and i think it's hard to make that correlation but i think it's something you need to think about yeah it's great advice and and, and as is the networking piece because like any change you know we're, we're in it together and i think like you say talk to people who've gone through the journey i know there were some horror stories early doors where companies were getting quoted thousands and thousands of pounds for someone to walk around and, and give them advice but i think that's that people start to get wiser now that that little bit that doesn't need to be the case yeah i think there's, there's an education thing as well isn't there um i mean i, I sit on i did very re until very recently i sit on the government's um, hygiene delivery council and i sit on the green jobs delivery group and um we've been trying to get a narrative around hydrogen you know because you know if you if, you, if i ask you what do you think of hydrogen you'll probably think of a disaster that happened some years ago with a, a, a airship um yeah. but you know if you look at it um you know hydrogen is going to be one of the key tenants of decarbonization is you have you know, offshore wind and you have excess offshore winds you've got when the wind is blowing and you've got nowhere for the power, you need some something to make. And so if you can make something like hydrogen, 
and store it for a long time, then you can get this intergeneration. So then you have a, an energy source, which has been stored like gas is stored in, in the, under the North Sea, et cetera. You have an energy source which is being stored and when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you can use that energy source to produce energy. So it's rethinking all of the uh, energy systems. And uh, But we need to educate people as well. You know, we've been working on this narrative uh, on, on what hydrogen is, where it comes from and how it's used and all that sort of stuff. And I'm sure, you know, on your retirement, you're going to be inundated with inquiries for, for people to come in and, and talk for you to come and talk. Uh out of those, out of those topics, which is the thing? And it might you might have already discussed this. You might be hydrogen. Which is the thing that really excites you? Would you say that your passion lies that you feel that you know people need to change their mindset on? Is would that be hydrogen? Um, I think uh, yeah. I mean, it, it actually goes across the whole the whole plethora of uh, of the energy transition topics. I mean, if you if you just start like you know, I don't know if you see these wind turbines. We, we've got a big facility at Hull um, where um, we've we've we make blades, wind turbine blades. I mean, the one that they're making at the moment is 108 meters long, right? 108 meters long. And just seeing these things, you think the engineering that goes into them, then these things are transported out in the middle of the North Sea. Yeah. Three of them stuck up on onto a, a nacelle that, that's stuck on the top of a pole. The nacelle's probably about 500 tons in the middle of the North Sea. And then this thing's going to produce power. So, you, you know, you, so you saw that scale of it, and that that excites me. And then you think, well, it, it's got to be electrically connected to one another. So you you have almost like these big offshore transformer modules, which are like they look like oil rigs. That's the sort of size of them. All the all the wind turbines are going to be connected to that. Then it's got to be connected to the shore. And then you think, well, I've got a connection on the shore here, and of course, all of the grid used to go like north to south from the you know the coal fields to the industrial centres. Now you're bringing it in from the east and the west and connect it up. And the volume that you're talking about that you need is much, much more. And then you say, right, okay, I've got all this electrical connection. And then you say, <clears throat> so what am I going to do when there is when there is excess wind and I don't have a requirement for the power? You think, well, okay, I've got to store it somewhere. And then you think, okay, batteries, but that's only short term. Then you think, well, how else am I going to do it when you're going to make hydrogen? Then you've got to have a network for hydrogen across the UK. And I, and I think, you know, getting back to the apprentice question, you know, as I say, these are great opportunities if you go back to the sort of when i think when i started out you know we were in the in the heydays of building up big power plants and things like that and, you know the transformation from coal to gas and all that sort of stuff during my career and, and all that's dropping off now but the i think the youngsters now it's great opportunities for them to get involved in all of this this is establishing the next generation of the you know the energy system for our country um which is a, a great place to be and then what's great as well, Steve, I think, is it, it's visible. I think the one problem with, with factories for young people is they, they don't know what's inside it. They're just these big these big buildings. And I think a lot of them would be in awe if they walked around Nissan, for example, and saw what's going on. But like you say, my my, my little lad's four, and, and he loves us to see because they're, they're fascinating. So to see these big turbos go around. So I think you're going to see more of that, that people, young people are influenced, I hope, to go into some apprentices because they'll be fascinated by... The how it how it all ties together and how it all works. Yeah, <clears throat> one of the things I did. Uh, I mean, we, we do quite a bit of outreach to schools and and things like that. When I was working in London, uh, I, I brought I went out to one of the uh, local schools uh, at Southall, and uh, we stood there and talked for like it was me and my colleague. We stood there and talked for about an hour. And honestly, these I think these kids had no idea what we yeah. sort of did. And, and and again, it's that's part of us. We've got to get the message out there. And and the the teacher actually at the end of it the, the teacher she actually came across she was in tears she says you know I've never felt so you know like inspired uh, by anything uh, I've ever seen before and it was like you know we, we make these great like emotive videos and things like that and, and it was it's great and I think we've done that in the UK where we built Kiwi Power Plant and we've had an outreach with um, the local schools and things like that and you start to get young kids talking about power plants and young kids talking about stuff and I think that's where you start to get the, the mindset change and the shift about what's happening around them, you know? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I'm really interested in, you know, what you mentioned right at the start about culture, trenches, management. I imagine you've seen a whole shift towards, you know, different cultures and, and different divisions in Siemens, but it's a company which has an unbelievable reputation. Um, it's a company that people want to work for and, and never seem to leave that type, mm -hmm. that type of business, which are, which are absolutely rare. What do you think is 
what's been important for you, do you think, in terms of when you're working in a, in a, in a unit or, or overseeing a team, what, what, the, what are the priorities for you, would you say? Um, I, th- I think, you know, it's, you, you've got to recognise, you know, as I said before, you know, we've got 96,000 employees across the world and it's, it's you know, we're located in every country. And to manage that sort of size of business, it's, it's quite a complex organisation. So you have to have a skill to be able to navigate the organisation because there's, there's lots of people, lots of departments, lots of whatever else. You have, you know, central policies and things like that. So I think, you know, one thing I would say is like understanding any any business, I think navigating the business, understanding where it is and where it fits. I think that's quite important because it could it can be like a bit, you know, overwhelming at times. Um, you, you've, got to, you've got to see that. I think I would always uh, focus on, you know, what's within your sphere of control and what a sphere of control, sphere of influence, and what are things that you can't influence? And sort of, if you get your mind around that, then you can sort of partition it a little bit about what are the things that you can actually impact on. And if you think of that, if you then got all your thousands of people around the world focusing on what, what they can control, what they can influence, and then somebody else is taking care of the rest, you know, that's, I think that's a, a sort of way to approach it. Um, like I said before, or giving people an opportunity to, even though you are part of big companies, giving people an opportunity to contribute and things like that, I think is so valuable because you, you don't know what you have within the within the business. I'll, I'll give you one example for us. We had um, we were looking at carbon capture and storage. So this is where you've got uh, basically, you, you know, if you, you go forward in the UK, twenty thirty five. If you want to generate power, you've either if you if you want to build a power plant, you have to either capture the carbon on the top of it, meaning so then you store it maybe under the North Sea, carbon capture and storage, or you've got to burn something else which doesn't produce carbon, like hydrogen, something like that. Yeah. And and we sort of reached out to our organization and said, look, we're we're looking at this carbon capture. Who would who would like to help? You know, that I mean that's quite novel. Who would like to get involved with this, you know, as well as your day job? And we found out we actually had somebody in one of our business that had a doctorate in carbon capture technology, which we didn't, I didn't even know was there. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's just, I think, creating those environments where people can step up and contribute. And I think that's, you know, people value that as well. You know, they feel that they can actually contribute to where the business is going instead of being told. We have, we have this little, I did a bit of work with a, a lady called Alison Cameron in Australia, from adaptive cultures. And this was about, if you think if most businesses have what they call a, a compliant dependent culture, you know, this is what I want to do, et cetera. And then if you ask people, where would they like to be? And it's like, they'd probably like to be in this collaborative growth culture, but like collaborating together and trying to grow the business. And uh, we found, we did a lot of work around that, that sort of concept about moving from being compliant dependent doing what you're told to somewhere where you've given a bit of freedom to contribute and grow etc and most people would want to operate in that sort of area and um, and it also it also um it, it releases what we call adaptive capacity so if you if you work in that manner you you create more scope to do other things which is uh, which is good i know it sounds a bit theoretical but it it, it certainly was quite instrumental in transforming the way that we think about our business do you think do you think a lot of, lead, a lot of leaders are nervous about that about what suggestions there might be there? Because I think that's the pension. yeah yeah I think a lot of people I think a lot of people quite like hierarchies I think yeah. a lot of people quite like to have you know I'm I'm the boss I'm in control but I think if you generally I think if you're more humble and you're more collaborative and you work with people across the business horizontally as well as vertically I think it it makes a difference to you and and to the people in your business you know they feel that they contribute we we used to when when we were Siemens like a long time ago um, I remember go, going to Red Bull Racing we used to sponsor at that time <clears throat> and we went to Red Bull Racing and we were sitting in reception and you used to see these uh, young engineers actually coming in almost running up the stairs running up the stairs to go and get something you know they were really inspired to be involved in what they're doing you know instead of like with their shoulders drooping thinking oh yeah i'm coming into an office another day and and it's that sort of vision for me is you want people to actually say i'm really making a difference and how noble is the cause that you know you're bringing energy to people and uh, and decarbonizing the world so you're going to leave in a better place than, than where it was when you when you came yeah, 100%. And actually, I think what you said there is so true. And I think companies <clears throat> underestimate the power of, of purpose. And I think particularly this generation, they really want to be part of something which is actually adding value to the environment or, or to, you know, to, to humanity. And that, that's definitely something I've seen. You know, when, when you interview people 
you know, the, the, the generations, the younger generations are, are definitely, it's, it's all to do with your purpose and what you were about as a company. It isn't just about money and it isn't just about terms and conditions. It's about like, are they doing something that they want to be seen for, uh, to be doing for society? So a lot of people have that view now, which is, yeah. I think, significantly different. You know, if I, if I think back, you know, when I didn't really think about it when, you know, I, I was around at the time of the miners' strike, the big miners' strike, you know, where, you know, coal was going all over the, the power plants and stuff like that. It was horrible times. But, and, and I remember one of the power plants, they couldn't get coal. So they were, they were tankering in this thick, horrible oil and burning it to to produce power. And you never give a second thought to it about like, you know, what this impact of the environment is, you know? Yeah, it is. It, it, and I, I completely agree. I do think it's definitely, I've seen a shift and I was almost a bit skeptical at first. You know, do people, do, you know, do people, is this this virtual signaling? Do people actually want it? But no, this generation, they really, really do, which, I, which is why I'm quite optimistic that we can meet these goals and we can change the, the problems because I, I actually think people now it's a completely different mindset and they actually want to help which is which is great i think it is and i mean and, and, the, and you think what does that really mean to people as well i mean um you know engineering manufacturing and things like that it's 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 going to be the next generation the next lifeblood of, of industries our our facility uh in newcastle which you, you might have driven past you know very big and that we used to say we used to export these be twelve thousand people used to work there at one point in time and if you think you know making turbines and generators complex pieces of machinery We've we've diversified quite a lot over the years, and even still are now. We're working, you know. This is a little bit strange. But we, we're working with um, a startup company called Geopura, and um, and they had this idea of producing uh, hydrogen um, power units, basically something where you can put hydrogen into a unit that produces off-grid electricity. And the original concept was, as everybody starts to get um, um, electric cars and things like that, you know, you can imagine going into a uh, um, a car park in the middle of Newcastle city centre and then you've got like you know a thousand people all wanting 100 kilowatt charges all at one time go to national grid they'll probably say yeah come back in you know 2056 we'll think about putting you a big cable in so the idea was you could put one of these on the top of the top of the car park perhaps you could then feed it with green hydrogen distribute power across the car park and then you, you know you've got you don't know any grid requirements so that was the original concept so we started working with this company called Geopura in in Newcastle, just doing these one or two uh, hydrogen power units. Now, if you go in the place, we're making 40 or 50 of them. Um, and this is, uh, it's changed now from pr providing distributed power to almost providing, instead of like having diesel generators on sites and things like that. So here, you, and the only byproduct you get is water. Only byproduct is water. And, and you've got some of the guys who've made turbines and generators for like 30, 40 years are now building these new high-tech uh, hydrogen power units in the facility. And I think that's a great example. People talk about this just transition of using the traditional engineering skills they set right into a new technology. And, and there's a great example in, in reality. And I think you could probably see that across engineering industries where people are moving and transforming into something different. Love that. And 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 I can feel that passion, which is amazing, and and, and others will too. And I'm really excited by what's what's to come, um, and particularly in the east, particularly the northeast. Obviously, where, where I'm sat, the the only challenge, or well, the, the biggest challenge, is probably going to be the skills gap, and and all these opportunities are going to have to be, you know, bums on seats essentially, and some good skilled people. Is that a concern? Would you say for the industry? It, it is. Um, what one of the actually one of the sessions I'm I'm in London. Uh, straight after this call actually um so i'm i'm participating so as i said i sit on the green jobs delivery group so people have recognized that some of the offerings maybe you know learning skills partnerships uh boot camps and things like that this is not going to give the sort of you know it, that's more incremental rather than the sort of fundamental shift yeah. so we're um the, the session we've got today is to explore interventions i'm, I'm talking about hydrogen because i'm on a working group of hydrogen in ccus but if you just talk about hydrogen the government have asked us to look at what interventions do you need to do to actually achieve that you know to make sure you've got the right type of skills in the right place at the right time the right quantity that type of thing and we're looking at what are the uh, cross cutting skills across lots of different industries this is one of eight the group i'm looking at is one of eight what we call task and finish groups uh, across lots of different industries and if you think about it, you know, like if you build a carbon capture plant on T sites, say, yeah. 
you, you're going to have a lot of construction type work who, who could be building high speed too, who could be building a nuclear power plant, who could be, you know, so there are a lot of cross cutting. And I think people are looking at specialist skills, but also cross cutting skills uh, to see what they need to do. But there's definitely a shortage of that. You know, if you, if you look, there is a lot of things going on in the UK at the moment. Um, if you just talk about the grid, you know, huge amount if you look at the amount of work that national grid are going to be deploying you know you're talking billions and billions of investment and they're all going to need you know engineers they're all going to need electrical engineers they're going to need environmental uh, um, experts and things like that so i think it's definitely there is a shortage and there's definitely um something that i think the government is uh, awake to and and I think all government, uh, sorry to say, all parties are awake to that as well. So I think it's it's not just this government. I think um, if there's challenges as well, oppositions as well, I think they all see that as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And and it's it's exciting. I mean, I was speaking to to see a win yesterday, and and you know they they were showing a list of the 400 positions they've been recruiting for, which which is which is scary but exciting. And there's so much opportunity. So I think if we get this message right, and we get this this generation involved, then it's just going to be unbelievable opportunity and you know and, and opportunity to to change the environment opportunities to earn money and, and progress and, and there's so so much good at this sector I'm, I'm really excited about it there is i mean uh, if you see it in action if you go to our facility at hull where we mm. make the wind turbine blades you know that, that facility didn't exist you know a, a number of years ago and now we've probably got around two thousand people and they're, they're continuously growing and recruiting you know as as wind turbines get bigger and bigger you know you have to remodel factories and things like that and there's a great example from in that area in Hull, the a workforce has been developed and built up, etc. I know Siemens, my old colleagues from Siemens Mobility, they're building a, a train factory in Goul. Right. Right? So mm-hmm. from scratch, completely, this is going to be for the next generation of deep tubes for London for Piccadilly Line. So they're going to be built there, but like uh, Hitachi did at Newton Aycliffe. So you can, you know, there's great examples of where from a greenfield site or brownfield site, these industries have built up. And, and as you know, as you as you build an industry like a facility, you get a surrounding infrastructure, like a technology park that provide parts and services to that uh, that industry. So you end up with a incremental growth from the the initial investment as well. What what a time to be in the east and and, and the north for once. Eh? There's, there's uh... a. <laughs> Yeah, le- le- leveling leveling up. I mean, I know it gets criticised, etc. But you know, why wouldn't you do it in in the northeast? You know, we've got like geology, we've yeah. got engineering skills, we've got great universities. There's a whole raft of reasons why um, you know you you should pick. Um, I mean, the northeast as well as many others. I was down in Bristol yesterday. That was at the um, at the National Composite Centre and seeing some of the technology that they're, they're doing there, and you see some of the you know people like GKN, Airbus, Rolls-Royce and people like that, they are really looking at advanced technologies for, you know, flight and things like that. It's, it's really clever stuff. I've not got you for too much longer, Steve, so I want to uh, maximise the time. Um, I always have a, a guest question. So this is a this is a question, you're not seeing this, so this is a question that is from my last guest, who was Rachel Steed. So Rachel is the uh, the, the FD of uh, Janice International, so they're uh, based in, in Peterley, really good business. So... Her question, similar to something you've been you've talked about already, actually. Um, as a leader, how can you make a positive impact with your influence on the culture of an organisation? What do you say? How can you make a positive impact on the culture? Um, I, I probably did cover that. Um, it, it, it maybe the start. I think it's it's being humble, um, involving people. I I I've created what I call an, an extended leadership team. So I've got a leadership team which is like the boards, the, the, the board of directors of the five companies got in the UK. But then I've, I've extended the leadership. So I've got a leadership team, which included, well, when I, until I'd resigned sort of thing, uh, a leadership team that included every business area head, every business area finance person, every support function, and they all come together and everybody's got an equal voice. So, and, and it's it's quite hard to manage, um, but it's, I think everybody appreciates having, being able to contribute to where we're trying to go. So I think um, and that then creates, I think what we're always trying to do is to create this tipping point of a culture. So you get a movement and then the movement gets bigger and then it gets bigger and then it becomes the norm. And I think that's the that's the key thing is to create these tipping points that become the norm. So try and uh, do it the way you were. I always, uh, I'm always quite <clears throat> reflective as well and thinking, how would you want to be treated yourself? 
in these sort of positions. And um, and and we we all play our part. I don't see myself any different to anybody. I've got a different job, but I don't see myself any different to the guy who runs a big lathe in the machine shop or uh, CEO Christian Brook, who who deals with all the shareholders. You know, we've all got a role to play in this uh, big organisation that we live in. And I think uh, if you recognise that and recognise that actually most people come to work to do a really good job, and just give them the opportunity to do that. Yeah, excellent stuff. And and what I normally do, which I will do, is um, some quick fire questions that you haven't seen. But spoiler alert, I've not printed them off, so I'm going to have to remember them. So uh, I've not seen them either. So, uh, but these are probably questions that I'd like to ask anyway. So, um, 1979, obviously, if you could, when you first started, if you could go back to that day, knowing what you know now, for all these years, what advice would you give yourself? What do you say? Um... What advice would I give myself? I probably wouldn't have done anything different from from where I was. Um, maybe maybe if if I had have known a little bit more about the opportunities that presented themselves over the years, that would have been worthwhile to just help me get my direction of where I was trying to head to. But um, I thought things things just came along uh, as as I went through the career. It wasn't sort of planned. I was going to do this or that. Maybe a bit more career planning would have been helpful. Yeah. Okay, I love it. Um, well, who's the best manager you've ever had and why, would you say? Um, I did an article on this a while ago, and this was a strange one. There was a guy called Andy Blay. Andy Blay, he's retired. He's quite he's probably knocking on a little bit now, and he was quite a stickler for quality and getting things right and double-checking and things like that, and I think that served me well during my career. A lot of people know him, but uh, yeah, and he was quite taken aback when I mentioned it in this thing. But but that's somebody I would have said stick on. But there are a number of people um, that actually have had an influence on my career. Uh, you know, without a doubt, that if I was to sort of like you know, if you had your desert island thing and said right, bring people on the island that have had an influence, there'd be a lot of people. Um, yeah. I'm probably I'm probably going to have a little bit of a get together with uh, some of them shortly. But uh, yeah, um, but he's one that stuck out the yeah. early days. Love that. Um, any books or audio books, podcast, anything that you've listened to, read that you'd recommend? Um, certainly, the work we've been doing with Alison Cameron um, from um, from Adaptive Leadership. She did uh, was it Leadership in the Next Millennium? I think it's called. Um, and that was certainly. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a journey you've got to go on to get to get there. But certainly, the work that I've been doing with Alison and uh, some of the sort of papers and things like that that she's been doing has been very helpful for me. Next, and and just finally, which I'll I'll split it in two. Normally, it's the plans for next eighteen months, so twofold, I guess. So, what plans for Siemens? I know you'll be a different part of it, but what, what would you say? What's what's the exciting things coming up? So, so I think plans for Siemens Energy. So, so we've got globally. I mean, these numbers are astronomical. We've got an order backlog of over one hundred and fifteen billion euros. Right, oh. so that's work that we've won that we, yeah. we have to execute. Um, so I think for us, the Siemens Energy, I think maximizing the the and i don't mean just the opportunity for the, the company but i think taking leadership in the energy transition and helping to actually because I, I don't think the energy transition could be done without siemens energy and i'm not being big-headed there i think it needs the stuff that we do um we've got some challenges in our wind business um which i think all wind manufacturers have so i think that'll be on the agenda to actually um fix those things which are well on the way to to doing that and then we've got we're bringing together the Siemens Gamers and Siemens Energy businesses. So I think my successor's got quite a challenge to actually integrate the businesses together. Um, so yeah, and and I think taking the leadership role in the energy transition, you know, with government, with uh, other stakeholders. So I think that's what I would say from a Siemens Energy perspective. Personal perspective, I think um, I want to have a successful handover to my successor, which is well on the way. So Darren's doing a really great job. Um, and, and then at the end of March, I'll leave. I'm going to have a break. And then I probably want to have, have a, a, a bit of a portfolio career. But I want to start off with a couple of maybe one or two NED roles, a um, couple, of, couple of days a month, that sort of stuff. Um, and maybe build that up a little bit. But I want to have more of a you know work-life balance. Uh, I've got grandkids now um, and I play golf very badly and I'd like to sort of uh, see if I can do a bit more with that. So yeah, just a re rebalancing. I was a bit I was a bit nervous when my, my wife works part-time and uh, when I said I was going to retire she says oh damn I'm going to school full-time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bad sign, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, love that. Look, 
Steve, this has been brilliant, and I feel I feel genuinely very privileged to have uh, got you on here and discussed this because um, you know, the career you've had is is unbelievable and is a real inspiration to to people of, of all ages and of uh, you know anyone out there because I think it's been amazing and you, you, what you said right near the end there about you know how humble you know you're just such a humble person I think that's so important for people however. In, as successful you get in your career, everyone is just a, we're just humans and it doesn't matter. Yeah. We'll just do different jobs, just a job title. And I think, you know, to have heard you say that, I think people will have um, taken a lot from it. So I just want to I thank you for, for coming on. Thank you for the career you've had and, and what you've added to this region, this industry and everything with it. So I really appreciate it. No, well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And I hope people found it interesting. Um, I've, I've done very many of these, so I hope they do. Anyway, thanks very thank much. You. Thanks, Steve.